வணக்கம் ஹலோ ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் அர்பனைசேஷன் ரெஃபர்ஸ் டு த ப்ராசஸ் ஆஃப் தி டெவலப்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் டவுன்ஸ் மோஸ்ட்லி டிபெண்டிங் அப்பான் நான் அக்ரேரியன் ப்ரொடக்ஷன் வித் பொலிட்டிக்கல் சோஷியல் அண்ட் கமர்ஷியல் ஆக்டிவிட்டீஸ் இன்வால்வ் வைல் ஏர்லி தமிழ் சொசைட்டி ஹேட் சீஃப்டன்சி அண்ட் சம் சோஷியல் ஸ்ட்ராட்டிஃபிகேஷன் ஈவன் ஆஸ் ஏர்லி ஆஸ் த டர்ன் ஆஃப் த ஃபஸ்ட் மில்லினியம் பிசிஇ and there were other markers of urbanization like a well established overseas trade network the organic residue analysis of an early iron age clay flask that was retrieved from phoenician west asia suggested the trade interaction with south asia the residue revealed spices that were exported from these regions spices grown in the western ghats marine archaeologist selva kumar points out to a very interesting fact of how Many of the terms that are used to denote a water going vessel such as padagu, vodam, oruva, vodi, vangam, panka found across all south asian languages have common cognates meaning common root words all of which belong to the proto dravidian language names that are proof of the strong maritime connection that these regions had with the rest of asia The Sangam literary works often refer to mudur mudu plus ur meaning old settlements and some of these mudur settlements might have emerged during the iron age itself and some of these settlements definitely became central places commercially and politically important during that period two such old settlements one being ambal in nagapatnam district excavated under the directorship of archaeologist selva kumar as recently as 2015 and the other being an ancient settlement at vallam in tanjavur district which was excavated under the directorship of archaeologist subarailu ambal in nagapatnam district is a very important site as the stratificated layers show continuous settlement right from the iron age to the modern times through early medieval and late medieval periods and throughout these periods the site has yielded a good number of iron and copper implements one of the early objects an axe found in the lowermost layer of ambal site and several objects excavated from vallam were made of high carbon steel In a research paper titled Ancient High Carbon Steel from Southern Tamil Nadu India Microstructural and Elemental Analysis conducted by archaeologist Selva Kumar of Tamil University's Marine Archaeology Department Amit Kumar Singh and Amit Arora of IIT Gandhinagar and Alok Kumar Kanungo of the College of Humanities Arts and Social Sciences of Flinders University Adelaide Australia explains the scientific metallographic analysis undertaken to study these ancient objects and have indeed established that our ancestors knew the art of making high carbon steel which later on became popularly known as the wood steel a steel that became very popular during the medieval periods that is around 10th century AD for making high quality blades the very term woods deduced from the tamil word uruk or yek that meant steel as well as the process of melting an interesting pattern is seen on the steel as a result of the process through which it is produced known as a crucible process the crucible process involved the placement of an iron source such as bloomery iron or wrought iron together with carbon rich materials such as wood chips in a clay crucible now the carbon source was either bamboo or leaves from plants such as the avare the metal was heated to 1200 degrees celsius now how did our ancestors invent this technology way back while the earliest written evidence of woods is from the records of the king alexander the great belonging to the 4th century bce a proper factory for woods production was excavated from kodumanal dating to around the same period the process of making wood steel was kept secretive for a long time and the steel was exported only as ingots during the medieval period wood steel was exported to the middle east where it was shaped into the very famous damascus swords and during the crusades thanks to the crusaders who encountered the muslim warriors using these sharp steel blades 
woods became popular in Europe also. And at that point of time, nothing produced in Europe could come anywhere close to the quality of the Damascus blades. And South India continued to be the leading producer of the steel for a long time. And it was only around the 19th century that Europeans finally gained some knowledge of how to produce the steel and some of the European travellers to India such as Francis Buchanan recorded how the steel was being produced using the crucible process in South India. So a process recorded from the middle of the Iron Age from the acts and implements of the sites of Vallam and Ambal Remember, we saw in a previous episode about the heightened bronze that was being manufactured in Tamil country. We saw how the metalsmiths made razor thin vessels by hammering out the alloy at very high temperatures of 600 degrees centigrade and how this metal was known for its tonal qualities and was used specifically in vessels for religious purposes. We also saw the studies conducted by Dr. Sarada Srinivasan on archaeometallurgy of heightened bronze that showed how the process was continued from the Iron Age into the early and middle medieval periods that is the 4th to 8th century AD right up to the Pallava era and beyond. In addition to the proof of advanced metallurgy, there was proof of advanced ethnomedicine we again saw in an episode of how a deep tissue brain injury in a skeleton was found to have healed before its death from a skeleton recovered in the Varsanadu Andipati hills and this ancient ethnomedicine laying the foundation of what is known today as the system of Siddha medicine. Well, despite all these markers, still there being no sign of urbanization as the archaeological excavations did not throw up any huge township sites. While the first urbanization in India is believed to have begun in the Indus Valley civilization and flourished between 3000 and 2000 BCE, we have seen how this civilization had extensive trade connects with the other ancient civilizations of the time like Egypt and Sumeria and even in the African realm and proto-history revealing that the Tamil country also had similar such trade links, yet no signs of urbanization. Post the decline of the Indus Valley civilization, after a gap of quite a few centuries, the second wave of urbanization in the north emerged only around 600 AD, that is with the advent of Buddhism and Jainism. And researchers claim that urbanization in the south started still a few centuries later. Well, the Tolgapium with its five land classification system clearly revealed that the Wur settlement of the Nadal region was termed as Pattanam, meaning a town. One of the reasons for this could be that while extensive burial sites have been unearthed, very few habitational sites have been discovered. As against about 1930 Iron Age megalithic burial sites that have been found, Hardly 176 habitation sites have been discovered and being a highly populated area, older settlements have been destroyed and built over and settled upon several times. Archaeologist K. Rajan of the University of Pondicherry shows how a holistic study of burial sites together with the living sites is what could reveal the process of urbanization itself as habitational sites yield multiple stratigraphy whereas burial sites reveal only single stratigraphy as burial is a one-time process. Now he takes the classic example of Kodumanal where the habitational sites that have been explored reveal the existence of advanced iron metallurgy, the large-scale bead manufacturing and a large number of spindle wars that were collected together with cotton pieces with woven pattern. An interesting feature in Kodumanal is that quads was mined extensively, not only at Kodumanal, but also at places like Arasampalayam and Vengam Medu, which were within a five kilometer radius. And this quads was the raw material for bead manufacturing and large number of beads at several stages of manufacture were discovered, but most of the beads manufactured here seem to have been exported. How do we know this? The burial sites in Kodumanal reveal very few numbers of these quartz beads but have more numbers of carnelian beads which were imported into the region, a proof of elite burials. Similarly, another interesting revelation is from the pottery 
The pottery found in the burial sites are of the black and red ware nature, very often not fired because they were for single time use. And some of the shapes of the vessels like the four legged jar were strictly ritualistic burial vessels. On the other hand, the habitational sites revealed rowleted ware and well-fired pottery, rowleted ware, believed to have been brought in from outside. So such finer points are understood only when a habitation and its burial site are studied together. We have already seen Kodumanal was a well-established trade center during Iron Age itself. And not only Kodumanal, Perur in Coimbatore district, Alangulam in Ramna district, Mangudi in Virudhanagar district, Tandikudi in the Dindukal district and Porundal in the Parani hills were all well-developed trade centers, well-established before the 3rd century BCE limit for early history that is fixed with the help of the Ashokan Brahmi inscriptions. While urbanization is a process and not a one-time event, settlements that were located in the crossroads of trade routes, the boundaries of eco-cultural zones, served as the headquarters of the clan chiefs during Iron Age and emerged as urban centers in the early historic period. The cultural development itself was not uniform. Why? Because of factors like availability of exploitable resources, access to these resources was not equal. For example, fertile agricultural zones played a dominant role in social formation when compared to the dry zones. We saw how chieftains in the hilly tracks dependent on millet cultivation and pastoralism came to be called as smaller kings, the Kurunila Mannargal, while those in control of the fertile plains and the rivers that also had the seaports at their mouth, giving them access to trade, made them more powerful, eventually leading them to becoming the greater kings. Thus, from the Kaveri River with its fertile riparian plains and leading to the old seaport of Puhar emerged the foundation for the Chola Empire. Again, the capacity to transform and utilize resources by adopting suitable technology and market mechanisms also played a key role. Example being the relatively dry Coimbatore E Road zone that dominated the exploitation of semi-precious stones and iron ore, industry leaders even then exporting their goods through the ports on the Malabar coast like Muziris that emerged as the Seranad. Likewise, people living in the coastal zones around the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Mannar, exploiting its resources like the pearls and the shank industry, held sway over the overseas ports by controlling the Tamrabarni and the Vaigai waterways that led to ancient ports like Korkai and herein emerged the great Pandya dynasty. Today, archaeologists like Professor Rajan are of the opinion that too much importance is being given to inscriptional evidence in establishing the beginning of early history in Tamil country. More importantly, new evidence that is being thrown up by archaeological excavations and epigraphical studies is showing that inscriptions were available in the Tamil country prior to the Ashokan Brahmi, thus shifting back the dating of the beginning of early history. We will explore more about the epigraphical records that ushered in early history period in Tamil Nadu in the following episodes. Vanakkam.